Hello and thank you for watching. My name is Jesper. I'm a sixth year medical student and this is a part one of a two-part video series where I will be discussing water electrolyte characteristics with a main focus on pediatric patients. We will try to get a quick overview and understanding of the main fluid compartments, what molecules are present, then recap how the water balance is regulated by the body through normal physiology. In the next video, so part two, we will talk about dehydration and lab values that might indicate it. We will also discuss how we determine the fluid deficit and how much oral rehydration solution we have to give, or if we have to give IV fluids, then how much IV fluid should we give and what are the indications to give IV fluid. Our goal here will be to get an overview. I will at times give numbers and percentages, but I don't think it's really important to memorize these. They're mostly to give context and proportions. So don't be worried because it's a lot of numbers. All right, so the first thing we have to note is that the total fluid levels in infants and children are generally higher than in adults and older individuals. As a rule of thumb, we can say that with increasing age, the homeostatic fluid amount will decrease. At birth, an infant is born with a total body fluid percentage of around 75 to 80% of the total body weight. In preterm infants, so babies that are born too early, the total body fluid is generally a little higher than in full-term infants. In adult males, the body fluid level is around 60% as an average. In women, it is generally slightly lower, averaging at around 55%. So already some numbers and percentages here. But in essence, we just said that infants are born with higher fluid percentages and it gradually decreases with age. When we talk about water compartments in the body, we separate it into two main compartments, the intracellular fluid volume and the extracellular fluid volume. The intracellular fluid compartment is the fluid that are contained within cells. It houses around 40% of the body weight for both infants and adults. And this number remains generally constant with increasing age. So in both infants and adults, the intracellular fluid compartment houses around 40% of the body weight and this number remains constant. The extracellular fluid, on the other hand, is up to 40% of the body weight in an infant, however, in adults, it is only around half of that, so 20% of the body weight. The extracellular compartment is found outside the cells and it comprises tissue fluids, plasma and interstitial fluid that surround cells. With increasing age, it proportionally decreases in comparison to the intracellular fluid. So in general, we could say that the intracellular compartment houses the most of the fluid volume. However, in newborns, the extracellular fluid amount is higher than it is in adults and therefore decreases gradually with age. Now let's talk about some of the molecules that are present inside the intracellular versus the extracellular compartments. Let's start with the intracellular fluid. The main Cation, which means positively charged ion, is potassium and magnesium within the intracellular fluid, while the main anion within the intracellular fluid is phosphate. Anion means negatively charged ion. The intracellular fluid also contains more proteins. Now, let's switch to the extracellular fluid, and the main cation inside the extracellular fluid is sodium, while the main anion of the extracellular fluid is chloride. Now let's move on to physiology. Our kidneys play an important role in the regulation of our water balance, as well as osmolality and blood pressure regulation. Osmolality refers to how much molecules such as minerals 
and ions are present inside our blood at any given time. The kidneys filter our blood through its functional unit known as the glomeruli. A lot of the water that is filtered is reabsorbed back into the body. If we are dehydrated, then more water is reabsorbed and less water will be filtered out in the urine. And in this way, the urine becomes more concentrated when we are dehydrated. However, if we drink a lot to avoid high blood volume, the kidneys will filter more water out and reabsorb less back into the body. This will then make the urine output higher and the urine itself will be less concentrated because there's more water inside it. Another important role is played by the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is a hormone producing coordination center within the brain, we could say. It can release a wide variety of hormones, but the one that we will talk about here will be vasopressin. Vasopressin is also known as antidiuretic hormone or ADH, and as the name indicates, it acts in response to dehydration. It will increase the water reabsorption within our kidneys. The kidneys can also regulate water balance by producing hormones. An example is the hormone renin, which by a cascade acts to elevate the arterial blood pressure. For example, in response to low blood volume, which can be caused by dehydration. We might remember that the renin angiotensin aldosterone system is the name for this regulating system. Let's recap this high yield cascade. Renin is produced by the kidneys. It converts angiotensinogen, which is a precursor protein produced by the liver, into angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin 1 is converted into angiotensin 2 by an enzyme called the ACE enzyme produced by the lungs. ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme and as we said the role is for it to convert angiotensin 1 is into angiotensin 2. And now angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor meaning it acts to constrict the vessel lumen to then raise the blood pressure within the vessels. It also increases the potassium excretion and water retention. It even tells the adrenal glands to release another hormone called aldosterone, which then further potentiates salt and water reabsorption in the kidney, increasing the blood pressure and the blood volume further. So we can see that this renin angiotensin aldosterone system really works to increase the blood pressure and the blood volume. As we see, the water balance is complex and it's regulated by many, many organs. Now we mentioned the kidneys, the liver, the hypothalamus and the adrenal glands. There's of course more mechanisms, but I think we have a general idea for now. That was it for part one of this video, this introduction. Now watch part two next and there we will discuss dehydration and fluid replacement therapy. Thank you for watching.